Uh, when I was a kid, when I was younger, um, me and my friends would all the time, we'd be outside, we'd go in the woods, we'd find a bunch of sticks, a bunch of leaves, uh, a bunch of anything we could get our hands on out there, and we'd build these forts. Um, and we tended to make them like very intricate. We would have traps set up if other people came out there. We'd have, you know, secret paths to certain parts. So it, I mean, it would go, it'd be huge. We'd have all these different parts to it. Um, and we would spend a lot of time and put a lot of effort into making these, just using our imaginations. Uh, we had a blast doing it. Um, but there was this one time we were making one at my friend Alex's house. Uh, and we had spent like two full days after school uh, this is an elementary school. We spent two full days after school uh, building this fort outside, and the night that we got finished, it poured down rain, and he had a creek behind his house, um, and the creek flooded, destroyed the entire fort. Like, the whole thing was wiped out uh, by the, the flooded creek and the water, um, and so we were devastated. We were so sad. Uh, all that work we had put into it just went to waste and um, we were just so sad that we put all that work into it and then it just got destroyed by the creek and uh, that leads us into our passage that we're going to be loosely leads into our passage we're going to be going through um, in Joshua uh, about Rahab and the spies uh, is in Joshua 2 and uh, the story is uh, takes place in Jericho, um, and Rahab's the main character, but there's also these spies that Joshua, the leader of Israel, sends to Jericho that are involved, um, and they're trying, the spies are sent to Jericho because they're trying to develop a plan of attack for attacking the city of Jericho. Uh, it is a land that God wanted them to take, wanted them to advanced to, um, and so that's why the spies were sent there, um, and there's a couple things that we can pull from this passage that I just want to briefly mention now, and we'll come back to later. Uh, the first is that God sovereignly chooses to save us, and that he does so in miraculous ways a lot of times, um, and also that God does not discriminate in who he sovereignly saves. Um, and that God can instrumentally use other people to bring about someone's salvation. And we see all three of these points in the story of Rahab. Um, they, all three of these points are evident in the story of Rahab. And uh, I briefly mentioned the spies earlier. They're an important part of the story, and a lot of, a lot of people just want to focus on Rahab. But the spies are a, a key uh, they're key characters in this story, and so we don't want to lose sight of them as we're reading this passage. Um, but yeah, these are these are points that I just wanted to briefly mention now that are going to be huge as we move through reading this passage, studying this passage, looking at it. Um, God is sovereign. He saves people without discrimination, and he can use other people in that process. Um, so those are some things we want to be looking for as we read through it. And so I'm going to start reading, um, and uh, I probably won't read the entire chapter, just, just the important parts, um, and then we'll go from there. So Joshua 2, verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the forts. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us 
and all of the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on earth beneath. That verse is going to be big, because that's Rahab's statement of faith right there. <clears throat> now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brother and my sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall, and said to them, Go into the hills where the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. The men said, Dear, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we, sh we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, According to your word, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. So we see a couple things right off the bat looking at this story. Um, we see what the spies were sent to Jericho for. We see Rahab's role in hiding them from Jericho's government and their officials. Um, and we see that they that she extended grace to them um, as she did hide them from them. She could have turned them in. Um, but we see that she recognizes that they are men of God, um, and she's heard about this God. She she lists how uh, the people of Jericho know about their God. They they've heard the stories, they've heard the tales, they've heard the mighty deeds that God have done, has done. Yet the people in Jericho, other than Rahab, have rejected God still, and are still turning to idols and still worshiping other things, despite hearing all the stories. They're scared of God. They you know they're they're terrified and they fear Him, but they don't worship Him. Uh, it's not a fear that leads to worship, and so they're rejecting God. And so, but with Rahab, it's different because she recognizes that these guys are men of God. She, she extends grace to them by hiding them from the government officials. Um, we get a statement of faith from Rahab in this passage. Uh, so she obviously heard the stories about God and reacted differently than the rest of Jericho. She chose to put her faith in that God. Um, and that is why she's helping these spies out. Um, and so this is huge. Her statement of faith is, is, is a big part of this passage, kind of the climax of the passage when she makes that statement. Um, and like I said earlier in the introduction, we have to be able to see God's sovereignty in this passage. It has to be evident to us. It has to be... Um, obvious as we read this passage that we see God's sovereignty. So first off, uh, these spies were sent to Jericho to scout for an attack, okay? That's what they came there for. They didn't know they were going to run into Rahab. Rahab didn't know she was going to run into them. Um, but they do run into Rahab, and Rahab saves them from being found by the guards. She hides them. She lies to the guards, tells them they go pursue them past the Jordan. Um, and so that happens. And then Rahab was in, in need of someone who could help lead her to God, who could help confirm uh, that she was indeed a follower of God, that she had put her faith in Him. These guys provided that for her, and the spies were in need of someone to save them from being found by the guards, by the officials, and Rahab provided that for them. So here we see all these things coming together, and you can see that God is sovereign through these things. This is just evidences that keep popping up. Okay, and then another thing I want to point out is the historical context surrounding this passage as far as like 
how the city was set up um, and things of that nature. So we already mentioned the spiritual state uh, of the people in Jericho at this time. Uh, we see that through the passage, but also through some uh, historical evidences um, and commentaries on the book of Joshua and so forth. Um, and but the as far as the physical makeup of the city, it's it's very interesting. Um, the city of Jericho was uh, heavily fortified, heavily defended, as I had mentioned before, um, and it was it was very advanced for that time, uh, honestly, because the way it was set up is it had one wall uh, around the it had one outer wall around the city. Um, and then inside that wall, there was a hill that went up, like kind of like this, and then plateaued like that. And then there's a second wall. Um, and then after that wall, there's another hill that goes up and up and out horizontally. And then there's the last wall where the main city is, where most of the people, the higher up people, are going to be inside that third inner wall. But this is interesting and is actually genius because if if attackers were to get past the first wall, the, the outer wall, where most of the poor people, uh, the disenfranchised people of Jericho, where those people lived, if they were to get past that first wall, they then have to climb up a steep hill to get to the second wall, where they're probably being fired on by archers and uh, all kinds of other stuff. So they have that advantage of the hills. And then if they somehow make it past the second wall, they have to go up another hill where there's even more defenses waiting at that next wall. So it's a genius way to set the city up um, because you have just this series of defenses set up where it's, it's genius and it's very, very hard to attack. So you can understand why Joshua would send spies to scout this place out, to find the weakness in it, to find how they can attack it. Um, it's totally understandable that Joshua would send these spies to do that because of the way it was set up. Um, and interestingly enough, Rahab, uh, her room, her family would be located in that outer wall, um, and it is believed that her family all lived in the same uh, house, room, whatever you want to call it. It's more like an apartment because it's inside of the wall, the outer wall. Um, she lived in the outer wall. Uh, and as we said before, the spiritual state of the people in Jericho, uh, people in Jericho, for the most part are rejecting God. They fear God, but they don't worship God. Uh, they're worshiping idols and so forth. Um, but Rahab was different. She had acknowledged uh, her fear of God had led her to worship and had led her to faith. So uh, that is the historical context for this passage. That gives us insight to why jo Joshua would send spies in the first place. Um, it's, it gives us context into where exactly the spies were, when they met Rahab, they were just getting in the outer wall when they found her. And so, and then when they mentioned leaving the scarlet thing tied to her window, you can picture that now as they would see that first right off the bat because she lives in the outer wall. So that, that makes more sense as well. Um, but uh, the, the main point of this passage is that everyone can be gracefully redeemed. Because there are two instances where grace leads to redemption in this passage. And uh, we're going to look at each of those and, and spend a bit of time on each. Um, but that, like I said, this is, this is the main point of the passage. Everyone can be gracefully, gracefully redeemed. And the evidence of that is because there's two instances in this passage where grace leads to redemption. And we're going to look at both of those. So uh, the first one uh, we see in Joshua 2 verse 4. And that's Rahab showing the spies grace by hiding them from the officials. Um, you, mo many people might not view this as an act of grace, but she didn't. She didn't have to hide them. She didn't. There was nothing. No incentive for her to hide them from the officials. Um, and like I said earlier, I think it comes from her recognizing that they were men of God, and she had recognized who God was. Um, and had grown to worship him and put her faith in him because of what she had heard. Um, and so that is why she chose to hide these people. She showed grace to them. She, she hid these spies from the officials because she recognized that they were men of God. Uh, 
that's my observation as I read this passage. Um, and I think that that act is force foreshadowing the grace that would be shown to Rahab later in the story. She saved them. She, uh, she was able to redeem them uh, when they were in a dire situation, when they were in a bad situation. Uh, and one thing I, I love about this part of the passage is that the spies didn't treat Rahab differently. Um, just like God wouldn't discriminate against Rahab, uh, the spies didn't either. Uh, you know, they didn't... I don't know if they knew she was a prostitute when they entered the city. My guess is that they didn't because they're, you know, they're coming to a foreign place. So I don't think they knew that she was a prostitute. Um, but even if, but they might have. Um, and either way, they didn't treat her differently uh, because of who she was. And in that time, women were looked down on. They weren't, uh, it wasn't anything like it is today. They were not of society so they could have looked down on her just because she was a woman they could have not trusted her but they chose to anyways and she saved them and it all worked out and without Rahab the, the spies probably wouldn't have survived they probably would have got caught if she wasn't there to uh, to save them to hide them um, so her role in the spies lives uh, lives was huge um, and in fact, their, their interaction with Rahab seems to be purely about grace because they don't even spy on the city uh, while they're there. They, that doesn't even take place. When they get back to Joshua, it's, it's actually really funny. When they get back to Joshua, all they say is, paraphrasing, they say, oh, well, we're, we're going to win. We're going to win. And that was it. They didn't give a plan of attack. They didn't say, here's the weakness of Jericho. They just say, we're going to win. I'll, I'll even read the verse. It's in uh, verse 23, 24. Um, it says, Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all that happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. So they tell Joshua, these people are scared of our God, they're scared of us, and the Lord has given this land into our hands. So they pretty much just, like I said, they come back and they're like, we're going to win. That's it, we're going to win. When they were supposed to be spying on the city, figuring out a weakness, putting together a plan of attack, that's not what they did. And uh, That leads me to believe that this is just God's sovereignty on display. Like They were sent to the city to spy, but they didn't even do that. They ended up meeting this girl named Rahab. Um, they ended up having this relationship with her that led to her putting her faith in God and led to them being saved and their lives being saved. Um, and so it's just an amazing picture of God's grace and of his sovereignty. And when they get back to, uh, and like I said, when they get back to their camp, they don't even lay out a plan, which was their whole purpose in going to the city. And so, uh, that leads me to believe that this is that they, their interaction with Rahab is just all about grace, all about grace. Um, and it's clear that that they were supposed to interact uh, because God sent them there for that purpose, and they didn't even carry out that purpose, and left without carrying out that purpose. You know that God put it in their hearts, like, okay, we can leave because we've done what the Lord wanted us to do, which was meet Rahab. Um, she ends up putting her faith in God. And that was that was what they needed there for. She saved them from uh, being killed, from being put in prison, from being tortured, any of those above things. Um, so yeah, it's it's clear that we see God's sovereignty in just the the fact that the spies were saved through the grace of Rahab. And in the second um, second instance we see is uh, in Joshua two verses eighteen through twenty where. God shows Rahab grace by saving her even though the rest of the city was destroyed. Um, so if you look at 18 and 20, it says, Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. And if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his, sh his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. So, 
the spies are saying if you do the things we're telling you to do and if you don't give us up, you're going to be safe, you're going to be okay. Um, and we see that we see that here, um, and this is a telling of what is going to come. The spies are saying what's going to happen, like she's going to be safe. Um, and when they do eventually go to the city to attack it and take it over, the whole city ends up being destroyed. Um, and there's actually uh, an archaeolo archaeologist that thinks they found, because historically they say that the only portion of the, the outer wall that was the only part of Jericho left was that one portion of the outer wall where Rahab's room would have been, where she would have tied the scarlet, where her whole family would have been. Uh, and there's an archaeologist think they found that, that one piece of the wall where Rahab's room would have been. That is the only thing left standing of Jericho because God wiped out the rest of it, um, which is just incredible, incredible, if you think about it. I mean... God did to a T what he said would happen. You see his sovereignty played out there as well. Um, but it's important to note that God saved Rahab because of her faith in him. We, we saw that statement of faith in, um, in verse... As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So that is her statement of faith, as God is who he said he is. Um, and she had come to realize that, which is incredible. Um, but the rest of the city was destroyed for their lack of faith in him. You know, like we said earlier, they feared God, but it did not lead them to worship as it did in Rahab's case. Um, and the... That's why her room, her family was the only thing that was spared. Her room was the only thing left standing in that city. Um, and if you think back to what had to happen for her to put her faith in God, she might have ne that might have never taken place if the spies never showed up and she had this confirmation that like, okay, these are men of God, this is my chance, you know? She might have never came to the realization that she needed to put her faith in God if the spies had never showed up and if she never hid them from the guards. So yet another area where we see God's sovereignty. Um, and we see that God saved her despite her background as a prostitute. This is an immense amount of grace shown here. Um, no matter what our paths are, you know, God, God can look past those. He, he looks past them because of what Christ did. And even in this instance, when he looks past what Rahab was uh, and saves her anyways, he's looking to the cross because all he sees is Jesus' righteousness in her place. He's not looking at the at the, the acts she's committed in the past. He's looking at Christ's righteousness, and that's what leads him to save her. That's amazing. Even though Jesus would come way later, uh, way later on down the road, he, he sees Christ's righteousness even in this moment where he's looking past Rahab's past, and you just see that, that God is a God that does not discriminate. Uh, we see that again in the story of Paul later on in the New Testament. Uh, after Christ, uh, the same thing happens. He looks past you know, Paul's history of killing Christians, saves him anyways, turns him into one of the greatest missionaries ever. Um, and uh, another form of grace is that Rahab was considered part of God's people right off the bat when she put her faith in him she's considered part of God's people because it said that God's people would take that land well she's still there she's left standing when the rest of the city is destroyed um, and so you know from that we can see that she's she's automatically made part of God's people or at least in in the standing when it comes to God made part of God's people um, and that's another form of grace shown to her so as we're looking back through this passage uh, main points God saved Rahab despite her background, uh, and God instrumentally used Rahab to save the spies, and instrumentally used the spies to save Rahab. Uh, it went both ways. Um, Rahab showed the spies grace by hiding them. We see that in Joshua 2, verse 4. God shows Rahab grace by saving her, even though the rest of the city was destroyed. We see that in verses 18 and 20. Um, these things are 
clear in the story, and the sovereignty of God, I think, is is the most clear in the story. It's made uh, so, so clear just through how the events played out, how the spies didn't even do what they came there to do, uh, or what they were originally sent there to do, and then they go back. Um, and so, as we're coming to a close on the passage now, let's look at how we can apply this passage to our lives today. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is that we need to extend the same type of grace that Rahab showed the spies. When, when they were in need of help, uh, she recognized that they were men of God and she helped them in their time of need. She saved them from the spies. We also need to be aware of the needs of other people so that we can uh, help them, save them in those times. Uh, and that we can extend grace to them. Uh, the second one is that we need to show no discrimination like God showed to Rahab. Uh, we, in our love for other people, in our evangel- uh, evangelization to other people, we need to show no discrimination no matter what a person's background is, whether they're a prostitute, whether they're a drug dealer, whether they're a murderer, whether they've been in prison for who knows how many years. we got to look past that and see Christ in them and see that Christ died for them uh, to be able to love them to be able to share the gospel with them so we need that same type of uh, sight that God had when looking at Rahab uh, third we need to instrumentally allow God to use us in the salvation of others we need to be willing to let God use us to bring others to himself we are not responsible for the work but he does use us as tools in making it happen, making it come about. Um, And that's an awesome thing to be a part of. You'll never be more joyful than when God is using you to bring about salvation in other people. Um, Fourth, we need to look for God's sovereignty in our lives and find comfort in that. I'm sure that, you know, after this whole story went down, both Rahab and the spies clearly could see that God was sovereign in this and that. Just the way the events played out, they saw sovereignty. I'm sure that gave them comfort in the future when they faced other adversities that I'm sure came later on down the road. And it can do the same in our lives. When we see God's sovereignty played out in our lives, we can trust in that and find comfort in that for the future when we face adversity. And I know I've had this happen uh, before in my life as well, where now I can find comfort in God's sovereignty because I've seen it played out uh, in the past. Uh, fifth, um, part of having faith in God is being willing to help those in need. We see that in Rahab. She, she gives her statement of faith after being willing to help those in need, but I still think they go hand in hand. Our, if we claim to have faith in Christ, yet we aren't willing to help those around us, we aren't willing to share the gospel with people, we aren't willing to love the people around us, then we need to take a hard look in the mirror because those, those things go hand in hand. And lastly, we need to be readily, we need to readily welcome people into God's family despite their background. Um, you know, we mentioned that Rahab was a part of God's people you know, after all this played out and after she put her faith in God. And we need to be willing to accept other people into uh, the family of God when they put their faith in Him readily. And you know, we don't need to shun them, make them feel unwelcome just because of a certain background that they have. We need to welcome them and make sure they know they're part of God's family. Um, and like I said, I just want to close out looking at this passage by once again emphasizing that this passage is all about grace, all about redemption, and all about the sovereignty of God. Um, I'm going to pray for us and then, then we'll be done. Father, I thank you for this day for the opportunity to teach your word and to study it and to uh, find truths about you in this passage and to to be able to know how this passage applies to my life and how it can apply to other people's lives Lord I'm thankful for what I learned in the time studying this passage and uh, in preparing this message and I just pray that this message would have uh, a profound impact on its hearers and that they would learn more about you and grow closer to you through the experience of hearing your word taught, Lord. Uh, I pray that I taught it faithfully, and if, if I did not, uh, I pray that you would correct those things in the hearer's heart. Um, you would let them know what was right and wrong in what I said, but uh, I know that your spirit was speaking through me, Lord, and that you were leading me through this process, and uh, I'm thankful for that, and I just pray that 
your word would continue to do what its intended purpose is and that it would never be stopped, never be shut down, never be abandoned, um, and that we would continue to treasure it for the rest of our lives. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name.